Thanks everyone for joining the Secure Software Summit today. In my session, I'll be discussing the importance of securing software with a zero trust mindset. Our agenda for today looks like this. I'll cover the following points. So defining what zero trust is, why zero trust matters to software security, and then the ways that you can leverage a zero trust mindset for your software supply chain. So a quick intro about myself. My name is Shanisa Cambrick, and I'm a principal program manager with Microsoft's Intelligent Protections Group. I've been in the IT industry for over 18 years and held different roles from application security, development, GRC, and identity and access management. On a personal side, I'm really passionate about bringing diverse viewpoints to cybersecurity and helping to tackle all of the challenges that we face there. I'm also a really big Marvel fan. I love Avengers movies, and I feel like there's a parallel between cybersecurity and then a, a group of good guys fighting a bad guy. So I love it. And then as we get in our, into our presentation today, a couple of quick disclaimers. The first is that the viewpoints that I express today are mine and shouldn't be considered a reflection of any of the organizations that I'm associated to. The next is that as I was building this deck, I was feeling kind of meme-ish. So you'll see a couple of memes throughout, but hopefully I didn't go overboard. So let's jump into it. So first up, we'll talk about what is zero trust. But in defining zero, what zero trust is, I really wanna talk about first what zero trust isn't. There's a few misconceptions about zero trust and how that gets applied to your environment. And one of the first misconceptions is that zero trust is a product or a tool, and that's not the case. So zero trust is more about an architecture. So there's not a single tool or product out there that you can apply to your environment and then say you have a zero trust implementation. That's just not the case. That's not how this works. The other misconception that I want to talk about is that once you've deployed a zero trust architecture, that it's like one and done, that there's nothing else that you need to do to secure your environment. That's not the case either. So zero trust is more like a journey versus a destination. And as your environment evolves and changes, you'll need to go back and reassess that zero trust architecture. And then the final misconception that I want to talk through is that Zero trust means your environment can't be hacked or breached. And actually, from a zero trust standpoint, there's one of the tenants that says you need to assume breach. You need to assume that there's an attacker already within your network. And so based on that information, what are the other controls that you can put in place to protect your assets and data? So now that we've talked a little bit about some of the misconceptions, let's dive into what zero trust is. Zero trust is more of a mindset or a framework or an architecture that's available to help guide the security posture of your environment. And one of the cores of zero trust is that there is no inherent trust for any of the identities that access your environment. There's a few guiding principles that we'll see throughout uh, this presentation today um, that I wanna cover. And the first is that you verify identities every time using a strong form of authentication. And that, just does, that doesn't just mean your users. You also need to think about devices um, and other types of identities, such as you know, bots or service accounts or machine identities. All of these need to be verified every time. The next guiding principle that we kind of touched on earlier is that you want to assume breach. And with that mindset in place, what are the other things that you need to do to protect the assets within your system? The third guiding principle that we'll talk through is making sure that you've provided those identities that are accessing your environment least privilege. And here, this looks like contextual access and limited access. So where is this identity coming from? What is it trying to connect to? What is the security posture of that identity? All of these things need to be assessed before you allow authorization into your network, into your environment, um, and access to different assets. And then the fourth guiding principle that we'll talk through is about segmenting your environment. And this kind of goes back or touches on that least privilege as well. So you don't wanna give any identities carte blanche access to your network, whether they've been authenticated and authorized, 
you only want to give them those portions that they truly need uh, and just in time and just enough access. The intent of zero trust is that we want to make sure that we reduce the radius uh, of an attacker within our environment. So going back to that tenant of assumed breach, and if there's an attacker there, you want to limit what they can actually access and affect. And building on, a zero, building on zero trust is saying that you've significantly reduced what that attacker can do. So again, it's not a destination, it's a journey, and it's going to evolve. So we've talked about what zero trust is, and this probably sounds a lot like an identity, security architecture, network security type of thing. And as a developer, you know, why should we care about zero trust? Why should having a zero trust mindset matters? And if you think about your environment as a house, okay, and with that house, when someone wants to come in, they're going to do so through a door or a window or some entry point. And your applications are like the entry point for your company. The applications are like the door, the window, and then identity is like the key. So those two things come together um, to allow entry into your environment. With identity, that's a central component of zero trust. So if you think about it, there's a lot of synergy between zero trust and application security. And as you consider you know, that mindset of zero trust and identity, and then your applications as the doorway, there's a few things that you wanna think about. So protecting data and applications from the inside out, protecting from the outside in, and then protecting those integrations in between your environment and your supply chain. So sometimes attackers may be coming directly to you uh, to get your assets, but it could be the case that they're coming through you to get to your downstream partners or vendors or suppliers, and then vice versa. Uh, attackers may be using your partners uh, to move laterally into your environment. So if we abide by those tenets of zero trust, meaning that we're gonna validate those identities every time, and we're gonna limit what they can access, then application development and application security really are about building in that zero trust mindset. And there's really large implications if we don't. So in looking at this next slide, in talking about uh, open source code, um, so there was a, a report in December of 2020 from Tech Republic that found that open source developers felt like securing code was a soul withering waste of time. And that is a quote, okay. They said they spent less than 3% of their time building in security for code. And thinking about the large number of companies that are leveraging open source code, uh, that means there could be huge global implications in that case when you're using open source and there's no security that's being built in. So going back to that December of 2020, in that same month, we had the SolarWinds software supply chain attack. And here, uh, this was a very large global impact for both private, public, and government companies. And then fast forward a year, um, thinking to our past December 2020, we had the Log4j vulnerability, where companies were scrambling to address that and understand what was the impact to their environment. Um, if they were using that open source software at all? And then what about your vendors and suppliers? And unfortunately, some companies were attacked as a result of Log4j. So a few other points of interest is that, you know, Forrester's 2020 State of Application Security Report says that they feel like application vulnerabilities will continue to be the most common external attack method. And then Verizon Data Breach Report says something similar that there's a trend of having applications as the vector of attacks, and that that's not gonna go away. So again, there's really huge implications to your environment based on the way that your code security posture is. And history has shown that we really can't assume, uh, especially in an open source scenario, that security is being built in. So just drilling into this a little bit more about who's responsible for security. So based on the previous slide, we understand that open source developers feel like that's not their responsibility. However, if you're using it in your environment and you're assuming that they're building it in, uh, you're basically setting yourself up for trouble. So we're finding evidence that open source developers aren't spending that time on security. 
And with this in mind, that's why I say we need to abide by the tenets of never trust and always verify. So the foundation of zero trust. And if we think about expanding that bubble of software and integration and, and touch points, uh, you know, considering your partners and maybe the open source code that they may be using or the vulnerable software that they may be using. And so this expands the footprint, um, the touch points of where an attacker may be able to get into your environment. Your vulnerabilities and your partner's vulnerabilities can impact your environment. You may be patching, but what about the companies that you're integrated with or connected to? And then understanding that security posture of your partners, um, because again, the that security posture of their environment is gonna impact your environment. So if you're not using zero trust, um, should there be an, a, a breach in your partner's environment, an attacker may be able to lever leverage that integration point to get into your system. So with all of that as a backdrop, um, we see that zero trust can be a pretty big driver uh, for software security and aligning with that is really in our best interest. But as developers, how do we take advantage of the principles of zero trust when it comes to securing software? Um, not just securing the software itself, but also securing the supply chain that the software is used in. So let's look at a couple of components of zero trust um, in the mindset of architected software. So going back to what zero trust is, being that mindset, that framework or journey, uh, we talked about zero trust has a really big focus on identity, on segmentation, and on assuming that you've already been breached. So with that as a backdrop, what are the steps that you do to reduce the, the radius of impact of an attacker? So in talking about segmentation, here you wanna look at your CI CD pipeline um, and your deployment environments and making sure that they're thoroughly separated and segregated to who can access those. Um, and throughout your pipeline, does every identity need to have access to all of those points? Maybe, maybe not, but that assessment needs to be done. The thing you're looking for here is making sure that you can prevent lateral movements through that pipeline by an attacker. You also wanna think about assessing your code as it moves through each environment. So you do a, a code analysis in, in one spot. However, you'll want to do that code analysis again as it moves through your CI CD pipeline. And then thinking about sandbox applications, uh, you, you wanna be able to sandbox any open source code to assess it, uh, but you also wanna make sure that you're securing those sandbox because again, those could be entry points for an attacker. And as you're thinking about segmentation, one of the things that I would encourage is that you want to build an application inventory um, that's gonna catalog all of the apps within your environment both what's homegrown, what's off the shelf, and then anything that's open source or APIs. We also wanna look at identity verification. So there shouldn't be code that's able to run um, in an unauthenticated way, especially if it allows access to some secure asset within your environment. We talked about the importance of using strong authentication to confirm an identity. And this shouldn't be just an ID and a password. And then from authentication, then you get into authorization, where we've talked about considerations such as least privilege, and then context and adaptive access. So as security posture changes for an identity, the level of access that they get should change as well. So you may have confirmed their identity, but do they really need what it is they're trying to access? And then assessing the what and the when and the why that go with that. And again, this kind of aligns with segmentation and being able to limit that identity to small chunks of what they only need to do within your network. So incorporating all of this requires a shift in the way that we think. So we're gonna move from being fast to being fast and secure. And you've heard the concept of shifting left of security. And this is really important because you wanna make sure that you're baking in security from the start. You don't want to get your code to production and then find a vulnerability and have to start from scratch. We really need to be intentional about how our environment is set up. So again, that segmentation and making sure that not all identities have access to everything. And then fully understanding what your code base is. So again, here it talks about, we talk about that inventory um, of knowing what's actually in your environment. 
And something that I think is really important is being able to threat model your code. So how could use of this code or this application be used against you or potentially be used against your partners if someone were to move laterally through your environment? The next mindset shift is from full access to just enough. I know that sometimes, especially when it comes to system and service accounts, you want to give it full access because you want that to be one and done. And so this application that runs with this service identity uh, doesn't run into any blockers. But with zero trust, we have to shift that. We need to give that identity just what it needs for that particular process or application. We want to reduce the footprint of what that identity has access to because, again, we have that assumed breach mindset. So just in time, just enough access. And then the third mindset shift is that we want to move from set it and forget it to periodically monitor. So don't assume that because your code passed a scan at one point in time and your environment was secure at one point in time, that it's always going to be that way. We need to periodically assess it. And this looks like going beyond just assessing users and privileges and with that, uh, you want to look at workloads and system and service accounts and even your applications. Are they still needed? Are they, are they accessing data that they don't require anymore? Um, so who can access what, when, and where? One of the things on the OWASP 2021 list, or number one on the list actually, was broken access control. So this is a really important component here. Something else that requires a bit of a mindset shift um, when applying zero trust to secure software is that you may want to consider CIA or confidentiality, integrity, avail excuse me, availability um, when it comes to your code. So in security, we talk about this a lot, but it also should apply to software security. Uh, and what's important here is understanding the goals of your business around these three different areas. This will help provide you a starting point of where you focus your efforts of security. And I wanna underline that this is a starting point. So should integrity be the most important thing for your business, that doesn't mean that you leave the other two things out to dry. Again, it should be the starting point of how you secure your code. You wanna go through the exercise of mapping your software components to business objectives so that you understand what's running in your environment and how does that support your business? And then again, how does that align to the CIA um, priorities for your business? So looking at zero trust and building a defensive software architecture, um, we need to look at this from three different angles. So again, you wanna look at protecting your environment from the inside out, from the outside in, and then in between. Okay. And then there's four different categories that you really should be focusing on at a minimum. Um, the first is identity, and this is like a broken record. We keep hearing that over and over, but everything revolves around identity. So who can access what, when, and where? And then the scope of this needs to go beyond users to the identity of things. So your APIs, your bots, devices, uh, system and service accounts again. So understanding what's normal versus atypical behavior for those identities will be really important for helping to detect um, if an identity is interacting with the software in a suspicious way. The next thing we want to look at is that integration. So here we've talked about, again, the segmentation of environments where development is performed. And then preventing attackers from using your code to move laterally through your environment or to your integrated partners. And then it's really important that you understand the touch points, both internally and externally of your supply chain. Do you know where your APIs exist? Do you know where you have integration? And then thinking through what happens if your partners are running vulnerable software, how does that impact your environment? And that brings us to the next point of, again, the assumed breach. And here, building your asset inventory. So the inventory scope needs to include everything that's in your software ecosystem. And you might want to consider what's in your suppliers or partners ecosystem as well. So that as vulnerabilities are announced, you know what you may be potentially open to. Definitely track the use of open source code. That'll make it much easier as these vulnerabilities are announced within open source for you to track down where it's being leveraged. 
And then here as well, you want to understand the behaviors of your applications. So should your application be used in a bad way, um, that you'll understand that and be able to detect it. This looks like building a baseline of behaviors for your application, like times it should be running, um, how long it should be running, et cetera. And then the fourth point is about code assessment. And we talked a bit about, uh, excuse me, we talked a bit earlier about threat modeling of software. And this looks like both angles of attackers to you and attackers through you. As part of your assessment, there's a few questions that you'll want to ask. So if this app or service code, or excuse me, if this app or service or code was used in a malicious way, what would the attacker have access to? Is there an opportunity that this code could be used for lateral movement where an attacker is going to pivot from your environment to another one? And is there an opportunity that this code has been set up in such a way that an attacker may be able to escalate their privileges and move throughout your environment? And if this code were to be used in some malicious way, what could they actually take? So could they exfiltrate something without being detected? It's really important to understand and to know where is data um, being sent, what is it being used for, uh, how is it integrated into your applications. If there's anything within your environment uh, integrated both internally and externally, you want to be aware of that and make sure you assess it. Okay, so as we're coming to a close here, really want to drill home some key points that in our desire to move fast um, in this digital world, we really need to do so in a secure way. And with our reliance on open source code and the high degree that we're all connected and interoperating, um, operating with a zero trust mindset is really a necessity. Uh, it can help build confidence in the way that our software is being used and helping us to be assured that it's being used as intended by the right identities in the right way. And so with this in mind, there's a few calls to action. Um, the first is that you want to know your current state. Then you want to assess your environment. You want to assume breach. And then you want to uh, continually assess. So in knowing your current state, you want to review where your environment currently stands, what's there. Um, this looks like that asset inventory that we talked about. And possibly using some type of controls matrix, um, looking at OWASP or the CIS controls or um, a CSA cloud assessment matrix and understanding where you may or may not have gaps within the protections within your environment. When you're doing this assessment, think about the direct versus the indirect impact. So again, it may not just be about your environment, but about those integrated touch points as well. And I've mentioned this a few different times, but threat modeling of your software. So the attackers through you and the attackers to you. And then be really clear on the risks that you're accepting as you integrate with your partners um, within your supply chain, those integration touch points. Don't set it and forget it. Um, security posture changes over time. Um, so this needs to be a reoccurring exercise. Next, you want to assess and recertify. And so this looks like understanding the identities within your environment. And again, this is not just your users, but also you know, devices and system accounts. Understanding what access uh, do they require, if it's still needed, understanding behavior, and then anomalies when it comes to behavior. And is this behavior expected? So you need that ability to detect when behavior is out of the ordinary. Next is about that assumed breach. And here we think about risk and resilience. So it's not practical to think that you'll never be attacked. Um, detect, if a determined attacker um, is trying to get into your environment, it, it's going to happen. So with that in mind, how do you make sure that your environment can recover? How do you make sure that you can detect those type of attacks? And how do you limit what that attacker can get access to? And then finally, you want to periodically assess the security posture of your environment and your alignment to zero trust principles, um, the identity verification, the least privilege, and then the segmentation. Um, and with those, using the perspective of outside in, inside out, and in between. So just to quickly reiterate our key takeaways, you want to start with reviewing your environment um, and with the zero trust lens. So assuming breach, least privilege. And then also with your CIA goals in mind. 
So that confidentiality, integrity, and whether or not availability is most important for your business. Second is recertifying identities. And that means all identities and looking at that from a least privileged perspective. Next is about being able to determine good versus bad behavior for your apps, um, your code and identities in your environment. After that, we wanna look at risk. So have a process for prevention and for detection. So again, we wanna be practical that you won't always prevent an attacker. So then what do you do to detect them? And remember with the uh, zero trust, we wanna assume breach. And then finally, focus on resilience and defensive software. So make sure that if there's another Log4j event, that you have an inventory and you can quickly find and fix those vulnerabilities. And then I wanna wrap with saying, make sure you understand the security posture of your integrated partners. That's gonna be essential to making sure that you keep a good security posture as well. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Stay safe and secure. Bye-bye.